А нас уже 24 человека, и это очень классно. Я думаю, что народ еще будет подключаться. А, а Ольга, мне представлять на русском, наверное, да, ничего? Потому что это же для нашей аудитории, для большинства, наверное. Нет, ну вообще, вообще у нас эта сессия, это звуковая дорожка оригинальная, она должна быть вся на английском, поэтому если вам не сложно, у нас есть переводчик, он переведет ваше представление. А, да? Окей, ну хорошо, а то я тут уже подготовилась, что я должна на, на русском все представить без проблем, тогда скажем на английском. И вот можете подключить ваши а, а, перевод уже. So, hello everyone, uh, it's good to see you all, um, and thank you so much uh, for letting us know from which country you are joining, from which cities, because Uh, we are always excited and the project itself is a regional, so we are really glad to see everybody from the region. Um, so uh, my name is Gauhar, I'm a project manager of Go Viral. Um, and um, today, uh, on the third day, I believe, on, <laughs> of our festival, um, we have a speaker, Seth Sinclair. Um, he's a language instructor and teacher, trainer, uh, with a master degree uh, from Boston uh, in applied lang uh, linguistics. Um, he has a, also very great experience in the United States, South America, Middle East, and now in Central Asia, because from last year uh, in Almaty, um, he's been working as an English language fellow and English language specialist. So uh, today's session is a workshop, um, gamification and distance learning, and I hope uh, you all will find uh, this workshop useful. Um, so over to you, Seth. Hey, thank you. Um, first, I recognize a few faces, so um, it's nice to see some of you again, and um, I'd love to go back to Aralsk sometime. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's nice to see all of you, and I'm glad that we have uh, so many people uh, attending. Um, I know that we have some interpretation going, so that uh, I have been an interpreter before, so спасибо, рахмет, thank you for the interpreter. It is not an easy job, so I'd like to uh, Thank that, and they can translate that before I move on. <clears throat> okay, so you can all see my screen now, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. yes? Okay. Um, so I know you, you started doing it before, but before I get too far, and I just want uh, a quick hands up display. So you can either physically put your hands up if your camera's on, or just put a thumbs up emoji or hands up emoji. Um, how many of you are from Almaty? From Almaty. So, or in Almaty now, I should say. How many of you are in Almaty now? Okay. Oh, I like that celebration sign. Let's see. Um, Okay, uh, how many of you are in the Western region? Raise your hand if you are in the rest Western region. Okay, raise your hand if you are in Nur Sultan or more north, like in the Northern area. Okay, now raise your hand if you are not in Kazakhstan. If you are not in Kazakhstan. Okay, I always like just doing a, a few demographics um, just to see where people are. So, let's see. Okay, uh, we have about 34 people. Um, I know uh, some of you, like me, they say, ah, you know, uh, I look a little sad today, so it may not be a good camera day. If you could, though, just because this is a language um, course, it's always better for me if I can see people's faces. If your internet is good enough, and if you can, turning on your camera just makes it a much better experience for everybody, um, especially if we happen to be able to do a breakout session. So if you could do that, um, I know that some of you may not be able to, but if you could turn on your cameras, that would be great. Okay, and I will go ahead and get started. 
So um, this course, uh, this class, some of you may have seen because I've taught something similar all throughout uh, Kazakhstan, even in India, even in the Middle East. Um, it is basically about, uh, about gaming and using games in classes to help education. Um, I have adapted it quite a bit over the last several months uh, because I've been working with a lot of teachers here in Kazakhstan on how to transition from in-person learning to online learning. Oh, Seth, you were muted. <laughs> can you hear me now? Am I unmuted? Yes, yes, you are unmuted and now we can hear you. Okay, said so the host muted me there for a second. Okay, um, so not sure where I got muted, but oh, uh, Raphael, did you have a question or? Um, Nope, okay. Uh, so we will be, I see a lot of people still coming in, that's good. Um, we'll be talking about competition and camaraderie. First, just a review of what that means. So competition, it's like two sporting teams, right? You have uh, Barcelona, Madrid, they're fighting against each other, right? They're competing against each other. And so that's the competition aspect. The camaraderie is within Barcelona, they have lots of different team members. And so each one is working together to try to build something stronger. So using proper games uses um, camaraderie and competition to encourage and motivate students. And we'll talk about that a little bit before we go on to some of the workshop aspects. So uh, first, I'll go ahead and ask this all around. How do games help in teaching and learning? This is an open question. So Anybody um, can, uh, can answer, you can just call it out if you can unmute yourselves. If not, raise your hand and we'll unmute you. So how does using games help in learning or in uh, teaching? Any okay. volunteers? Uh, we don't have volunteers, we have victims. <laughs> it can, okay, go yeah, ahead. hello. Uh, it, yes. can, it can help um, to involve uh, children. Uh, and uh, um, it's getting more interesting for them and uh, uh, they can make some um, associations with that in games. Uh, English uh, grammar, for example, they can make some association in games and etc. something like that. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ziri and uh, Farisa were saying it helps keep them motivated, it keeps the students' attention. Very true. If we just have a test, Students are gonna get bored or anxious really quick. Um, but if we actually do something that keeps them uh, involved and engaged, it makes it a lot, uh, a lot better. So this is some of the biggest reasons why I like using games and gamification, no matter where I've taught. Um, as I was introduced, you know, I've uh, lived in uh, the Middle East, lived in Central Asia, taught in Europe, taught in South America, taught in North America. And in all these places, no matter what the cultures are, the demographic, I've always had a better chance of teaching languages when I get the students engaged in some type of game or competition or activity. So old school style teaching is mainly lecturing. So that's me standing in front of you, writing on the board and you copying it down and maybe that's it. Okay, that's old lecturing. Most people, they only retain, they only remember about 5% of what's taught by lecture. With reading, there are 10% of people that normally retain the information. And then you have the audio and the visual and you're starting to add uh, those type of things, you get a little bit more, but these are all still passive methods of teaching or of learning. And you only can max learn about 30% that way. But when we start getting into the participatory teaching methods, that's group discussion, practice, teaching others, that's when we actually get to learn 50, 75, 90% we actually start remembering. And that's what games do. You have that group discussion when you have the teamwork deciding, oh, should we do this, should we do that? They're practicing it actively. And when one student doesn't understand, they teach, uh, another student can teach them and they're teaching others. So it's engaging that higher level of, of retention. Um, this is one thing that I always like to, uh, to watch out for um, when you're doing type of gaming, because I've seen it happen a few times with, uh, with teachers. And that's when they just have one or two students answer the questions in the game. So like, oh, I know these students are gonna know the answer, so I'm only gonna pick on them, I'm only gonna have them do the activity. 
you want to make sure that when you're doing games and activities, you're not doing it just like the teacher who's just picking the few students. You want to involve everybody. You want to make sure that everybody has a chance to participate. And when you are implementing games and gamification properly, you can do that. In some ways, it's easier online. In some ways, it's more difficult. But we'll talk about some of, uh, <clears throat> some of those in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the effective filter is uh, maybe a term that some of you may have heard or not. Basically, what that means is it's the stress level that prevents us from learning. So in general, who learns a language faster? Somebody who is shy or somebody who is outgoing? What do you think? People who are shy learn a foreign language faster or people who are outgoing? Outgoing, the second one. Outgoing. Yeah, right. Why is that, Nurla? Why do you think so? Um, uh, because they are trying to practice a lot, but shy people are trying to kind of not engage in the process. Exactly. So and are they the, worried about making a mistake as much? Uh, second one, no. They just do it like yeah. mistake. They're trying to learn from the mistakes. But shy people are trying to more focus on the mistakes and this kind of stopping uh, them to be as much active as it needs kind of in the process of learning language. It, exactly. And there's a myth that's partly true that I want to correct here. It's partly true. And most people think that kids learn languages better and faster than adults. They can learn accents better. Their accents can get better because they can actually hear more sounds than adults can. And so if they learn at a younger age, their accents can be better. But as far as learning how to communicate in that language, adults, teenagers, at any age, we can do that better and sometimes because we can understand how the language works. The problem is, if you see a young child that's trying to say something and they say it wrong, are you going to make fun of them? If uh, my three-year-old daughter, uh, she's not three now, but when she was three, if she says, I go to the store yesterday, nobody's going to make fun of her and make her feel bad for it. They might correct her and said, oh, no, you mean you went to the store? It's like, no, I go to the store. After a while, she'll get it, but she's not afraid of making a mistake. That effective filter is what I'm talking about, is when there's so much fear in a room about making a mistake in a language, then people don't learn as much. And so when you're in a test, and let's say the only way you learned a language was always taking a test. Most people would not learn a language, right? You want to have that engagement. You want to have that involvement. And so when the students are, <clears throat> excuse me, when the students are actively participating in a, a game, in an activity, they're not thinking about, oh, am I going to make a mistake here? They're just trying to win. They're just trying to help each other. And it lowers that inhibition that they have. They're more willing to take risks. And when you're learning a language, taking risks is so important. You are never going to get something right the first time. You're going to have to practice it again and again. And you have to be willing to make that mistake and not let it bother you. And when you are doing uh, games and stuff, it really lowers that aspect. So people are more willing to make, uh, to make the mistakes. OK, now how does competition help? Talked about that a little bit. So it motivates the students to win, want to do better. Okay want to do better than somebody else. They're competing. Um, you might see this when you just talk to a student on their own and they're not really trying, but then you put them against another students. They might want to try just to do a little bit better each time. I do that with my kids sometimes. Like, okay, who can clean their room the fastest? And when they work really hard to see who can clean their room the fastest, it really helps to... Uh, um, it really helps to get things set. Um, just one second. My uh, Google is acting up. So just one second here. Go to the Google Play Music app to transfer your account. I sent a notification to your phone with more information. Okay, Google, stop. Okay, Google, stop. I love smartphones and smart devices and smart homes. We have Google Home Mini in our house. But every once in a while, they hear something I'm saying when I'm not talking to them, and they bring things up. One of the advantages and disadvantages of modern learning environment that we have. Um, anyhow, thank you for uh, putting up with that interruption there. Uh, but competition, it helps students because they want to motivate, like I was talking with my kids. If I just say, go clean your room, like, oh. I'm like, okay, who can clean their room the first? Whoever cleans their room the fastest and the best, maybe they get a little reward, maybe they get this, they're competing, and now they do it faster. Now, how does camaraderie help? It's positive peer pressure. 
Normally when we think of peer pressure, we think of something like people smoking, right? Or doing drugs or doing something they shouldn't like, oh, come on guy, you should do, go out drinking with us. You should do something that you sh wouldn't normally do. Positive peer pressure is when like a student is afraid. They don't wanna make that mistake. They don't want to get out in front of people. They don't wanna try. And their friends are like, you can do it, come on, you can do this. And that's the positive peer pressure aspect that these students have when they are in a team um, in gamification. Okay. Um, so, proper use of games, it helps by feeding their desire to, um, to win and they want to belong. They want to be part of something else. So that's where the competition and camaraderie come in. One of the other aspects, and I'm gonna take a quick poll real quick, um, see how we're doing on time, okay. So, um, raise your hand if you are more of a visual learner versus a, an auditory learner, versus a kinesthetic learner. So if you are a visual learner, raise your hand. If you are a visual learner, raise your hand. Okay, got a lot of visuals here. That's good for a, for a video conference. <laughs> that, that actually makes it easier in many ways. Um, now, hands down, hands up if you are an auditory learner. So you learn most by listening, by hearing. Got a couple, okay. Okay, hands down. Raise your hands if you are a kinesthetic learner. You learn by doing, by manipulating, by working with your hands. That's me. <laughs> so for me, when we get a brand new game that we've never played before, my wife, she reads the rules and she knows how to play it. Me, it doesn't matter how many times she reads it to me or how many times I read it, unless I sit down and practice it, I don't actually understand it. I have to do it physically. When you are playing the proper use of games, you are using all of those aspects. It's a little less with the kinesthetic, unfortunately, online, but even with that, there's tools that you can use to manipulate in different games. Um, even just clicking on a button is something physical that you're doing instead of just speaking out. And so it, it helps with all different types of learners. And none of us are just one. Um, even though I think uh, Nurlai said he was a visual learner, that doesn't mean that that's the only way he learns. He probably is a little bit of visual, a little bit of this, but visual is just most, but this helps with all aspects of it. <clears throat> okay. What type of games do you use to learn or to teach? So I'm just going to open this up for anybody. What type of games do you use to learn or to teach? While other people are thinking, I'll ask Margarita. What type of games do you use to learn or to teach? I've seen you use a couple, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Um, I try to use different types of games, but my favorite is Jeopardy. When I divide my class into two or three teams and then they have to uh, revise some material like grammar or maybe vocabulary or um, I don't know, something, country study maybe. And uh, it actually helps them to understand that they can, uh, they can use their knowledge and they can practice it and they see the practical side of learning something. And when they win, of course, they are like happy. So I like Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah. Um, if we have time today, and I actually have a Je Jeopardy game set up, so it depends on the timing, but I like Jeopardy a lot um, as well. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see, anyone else have any ways for teaching or for learning that you use games? I'll give you an sometimes, idea for me. I use Duolingo. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sometimes, for example, not learning, but kind of during the trainings, uh, when I was to be a mentor, I used to practice some energizers, like between uh, learning process between training, for example, doing some games, sort of the games, in order to make their stress le less stressful conditions, kind of. Okay, so to lower the stressful conditions. Okay, I saw a couple people mentioning uh, Quizlet, Kahoot. Um, we'll talk about those different board games. Okay, I like that as well. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's lots of different uh, different ideas of what we can use. We'll talk about uh, a lot of those today. But um, one of the biggest things I think is what uh, Nurlai was touching on is just lowering that stress level, 
um, just making it so people are more more willing to engage and to uh, to deal with things. For me, when I'm learning on my own, as I was saying, I use Duolingo, which is a uh, an app to practice languages. Um, as I said, I speak uh, speak Spanish, but my Russian is like almost non-existent. So I practiced before I came here learning Russian on that. My daughter does as well. And she actually went really far. She went super fast, always wanted to be on it. And um, she she actually learned quite a bit just on her own because it was she was competing against herself. But if I asked her to do a worksheet in Russian or to practice, no, she wouldn't want to do that. But because it was done in a game style fashion, it uh, it was really, it really motivated her, really motivated her. Okay, um, let's see, I'm reading what did I wrote. Uh, proactive teachers, the ones in my school just made writing an essay on a topic. I've never, okay. Um, so uh, you can also do games with writing. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to talk on that, but there are different games. I love brainstorming games and switching. And I even have students, one student might start telling a story, okay? And then the next student will have to continue that story. And then the next student will continue that story. And sometimes it can get crazy, but they're not worried about it. So they're practicing and you can hear where their English level is. Um, and you, you get to know the students a little bit better in that, uh, that aspect as well. Okay, um, so I'm not gonna do the breakout session right now, based on time, uh, but we're just gonna talk about a few of these because uh, you guys mentioned some of them anyhow. Um, so, you asked, uh, Kahoot is the one we're actually gonna be playing a game of Kahoot today. I told you a little bit about Duolingo. Plickers, I've heard of people using it online, but it's much better in person, so we won't be focusing on that one much today. Um, raise your hand if you have used Kahoot in the classroom. Now, that can be learning as a teacher or as a student. So raise your hand if you have used Kahoot as a teacher or as a student. Okay, we have a few. Most of the time I have a few people that have done it. Uh, last month, I had a cohort that I was teaching. There were 50 teachers and there was only, no, there were no teachers that had ever used Kahoot before. It was very surprising um, because it's, uh, it's quite popular nowadays, but there were lots of teachers who had never used it. So I, I created a little um, way for them to practice uh, using it as well. So, um, Quizlet, raise your hand if you've used Quizlet before as a teacher or student, Quizlet. I don't see any hands, but there should be one because I saw someone mention that earlier. Okay, now there's a couple. Okay, now raise your hands if you have used Duolingo. Okay, got a few. And I won't worry about flickers yet for this. So one of the good things about these type of electronic games, it's great for online learning, obviously, um, because the students uh, can do it online, it's all digital, but it gives them instant feedback. So when, like right now, I'm in the middle of grading a lot of essays for, uh, for some university students, and it's taking me all weekend. I can't give them the instant feedback that I would like because I have so much information to go through. But with uh, things like this, they know immediately what they got right, what they got wrong. And normally during the lesson, um, during the, the game, I pause it and I say, hey, do you understand why you got that wrong? Why you got that right? Why'd you choose this? Um, and that instant feedback really helps teachers know as well, not just the student. It helps us to know what lessons we need to focus on the more, um, what problems that they're having. Are they, okay, so they're having problems with uh, past tense verbs. Um, or the past participle, they don't know when to use that. And so it helps me because I can see how many students got which questions right and wrong. Um, it's actually helped me a lot here teaching in Central Asia. Um, excuse me, because uh, there are lots of different, uh, sorry, I was looking at uh, Farisa's question. I'll answer that in just, a, just one second. Um, but there are lots of aspects that are different in different places that I teach. For example, when, um, when I teach students from, uh, from uh, a lot of uh, Southern Asian countries, they have a hard time distinguishing between the L and the R sounds. And so I had to focus on that and I knew that, but I didn't know that here in Central Asia with, with Russian specifically, um, there aren't as many articles that are used as there are in English. So in articles, I mean A, 
an, the, and so how to use articles um, was not, uh, isn't something that they were getting. And by playing some of these games, I was able to figure that out. So to answer uh, the question, how often should you use these? As often as necessary. Uh, I know that sounds like a cop-out answer, but it's not. Basically, when you need to, um, to do a review, when you need to see where your students are, when you um, just like, okay, my students are burned out, I need to have a game to get them engaged. I do review games. I do um, uh, pre-test, uh, sorry, uh, review games. I do a game just to assess their knowledge to see what I need to test them on. And then sometimes, uh, you know, they can earn it however they want. But um, as long as you are using it to actively learn and actively test their learning as much as is needed. Um, the thing is, you don't want to play games just for game's sake. There has to be a purpose. There has to be a reason. There has to be um, some other aspect uh, behind it. Um, so it, it really makes a difference in that aspect. Okay. So I'm going to turn my sound on here to make sure you guys can hear. Please let me know that you can. This is just a quick uh, how to host a Kahoot for those of you who haven't done it before. Okay. Actually, you don't really need to hear it. It just has the cool music that everyone seems to like. Every time students in my classroom heard this music, they got really excited because they knew we were going to be playing again. going to be playing a game really quick. I'm going to open this up in just a minute. I'll stop sharing this screen. Uh, but first, I'm going to tell you some of the advantages and disadvantages with Kahoot on distance learning. Um, the advantage we already talked about a little bit. You have that instant feedback. The students can actively participate. Disadvantage with the way they have it organized is you have to have two, um, two platforms. So we're going to be using Zoom. So I show you the questions. And then you'll have to have another web page or another device open to actually answer the questions. And so sometimes you might have to switch between two different, um, two different uh, web browsers or two different tabs in order to do that. So it slows it down a little bit, but it's still possible. Um, my daughter got upset when she first started playing because she just had a small little tablet that couldn't switch tabs quick. And her friends that were playing um, on the other side of Almaty had two different devices. So they were able to answer faster. Um, so that's one of the downsides. One of the upsides is they've actually gotten it better because it used to be just for online, excuse me, it just used to be for live play. So designed specifically for um, synchronous learning, in person or not in person. But they actually have it now where if you click on one of their, um, excuse me, um, if you click on one of their uh, cahoots that they have, you can choose to assign a Kahoot to your students. And then they can practice that on their own. So they're not competing against other people then, they can just do it when they have access to it, which is really great in places that don't have very good internet or when you can't get everyone together at the same time. Because then you just send them an email saying, this is your homework assignment, do this Kahoot on your own time, do it until you get an 80% or something like that. And even though it may take them a few times to get that percentage that you're asking for, every time they're doing it, they're learning because they're like, oh, wait, why was that wrong? This is wrong. They have to think about it themselves. And you can talk about it the next time you get to meet with them in class. Okay, you can all see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, yes, for those of you who have not played Kahoot, 
Um, wait, it's still loading the pin. <laughs> you will see a pin number on there. We'll go to kazoot.com. And you will type in that pin number and it will take you directly to this, um, to this gig. So please use your real name. Uh, first name is fine. Um, we probably have a few people with the first name, but please use your real name um, in English if you can for your Kahoot name. So once again, just go to kahoot.com and it will ask you if you want to join. Thank you, Medina. And you can join, uh, join this game. And I'll go ahead and put the sound back on because most people seem to like it. <laughs> And for those of you, <laughs> I've misspelled my own name too a few times. Uh, my, <laughs> um, uh, to those of you who may not be able to join for whatever reason, still try to answer the questions um, like on a piece of paper or just remember them so you can see. Uh, this particular Kahoot, if I picked the right one, I hope mm -hmm. you, um, is about the that I just heard what's about. Say again. Uh, I should to reg register here in Kahoot. Yes, enter the Kahoot. Just, no, just no, go you to don't have to. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't have Kahoot to register. Eat. Oh, no, you don't have to register. Sorry, I misunderstood. No, you don't have to register. That is one of the advantages of Kahoot. Some of the free game playing software, every student has to register, and that is very frustrating. <laughs> So we'll go ahead and start in about 30 seconds. Um, you can still log in. Um, can somebody type in the game pin code into the chat, please? Type in the game pin code into the chat. Can somebody do that, please? Um, that way, if uh, somebody, thank you. That way, if somebody needs to uh, enter afterwards, after we've started, they can still enter. So we're going to start in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. And even if you can't, haven't entered yet, you still will be able to enter later on. The cheetah is blank fastest land animal. A fastest, the fastest, and fastest, or nothing. Okay, most of us got us right. Awesome. So, the fastest. Almost always, when you have a superlative like this with the EST at the end, it's almost always going to be with the. My Zoom screen was covering up the next, just a second. <laughs> there we go. So who is in the lead? We have Zed in the lead with Margarita not far behind. Um, Zed, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, actually you pronounce it really good because all the foreigners are always like, Ziri, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you're pronouncing <laughs> it in a great way. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, trust me, as my name is Seth, and I'm in a Russian country, and Russian and Kazakh both don't have the TH sound, my name gets mispronounced all the time. So I totally understand. I'm always Set, Set. But Seth, for those of you who can pronounce the TH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What blank nice view? What the nice view? What any nice view? What some nice view? What, what a nice view? So we only had one get it wrong there. So a nice view. Uh, 
I need a new pair of shoes. I need a blank new pair of shoes. Of shoes. I need a new pair of shoes. A in that sense just means um, one, really. <clears throat> My father is vet. <laughs> Father is a vet. Nice job. This one normally throws more people off. So an explanation of this, this is vet as in veterinarian. That's why it showed him working with animals. Whenever you're talking about a profession, you wouldn't say my father is the vet because that would mean he's the only vet ever. He's the only vet anywhere. You could say he's the vet at a particular place if he's the only one, but you want to make sure that you just say a vet if you're describing a profession in general. I am a teacher trainer. I am a teacher. I am an educator. Okay, you were keeping that lead there. <laughs> I left my glasses on. It's a very specific floor. It's the floor that the glasses are on. So it's a very specific floor, therefore it's the. Come to school on us. school on the bus because the bus you're going on is the same bus every day. You always have the same people picking you up. Now, if you're going on a different bus every day, you might say a bus because it can mean any particular bus. But most people, when they're talking about getting to school using a bus, it is talking about the same bus that they take every day because they have to be there at the same time. So it would be the bus. So why is it, um, okay, so we, last night we had dinner in restaurant um, is, oh, sorry, no, the restaurant is what people are picking up at. So no, it is not, um, last night we had dinner in a restaurant instead of the restaurant, because a restaurant means that it could be any restaurant. We don't know specifically what one. If you say the restaurant, that means there's only one restaurant in Almaty, and last night that's where we ate. And so we ate at the restaurant. Now, if I say to my colleagues um, that work at a particular university, and I say, I'm going to the university, that makes sense because they know specifically what university I'm going to. But here, it doesn't tell us anything about the restaurant. So we have to um, use, excuse me, uh, a restaurant in that case. <gasps> she was finally dethroned, okay. He works in? Okay, so why is it an office and not a office? Anyone want to answer that one? Sorry, I'm in teacher mode now. <laughs> 
I can say that uh, because uh, O that's waffle, so that's why we should use N instead of A. Can you hear me? Okay, exactly. And it's because of the sound of the O, not because of the letter. People oh, get okay. that confused sometimes because, for example, the word university, um, it starts with a U, right? But it yeah, makes right. the sound of a Y, yeah. And so you wouldn't say an university, you would say a university. So you're completely correct, but it is the sound of the vowel. If there is a vowel sound beforehand, you use an to separate the two vowels. Thank you, Agarim. My favorite subject is language. See, I love going through these because it gives a chance to, to see it. Because some of these, the only rule that's always the same with English is that there's always an exception. <laughs> and so I want to explain this one a little bit too. When you are talking about subjects, when you're talking about subjects from school, English, math, science, history, Kazakh, you don't need to have the article there unless you're talking about something specific. For example, my favorite subject is math. You wouldn't say is the math. But if you wanted to say something specific about a specific type of history, my favorite subject is um, the history of Kazakhstan, okay? Now that's a very specific history. And then you would use the in that case. But most of the time when we're talking about school subjects, we do not need to use um, an article. So I know this uh, course wasn't supposed to be a grammar lesson, but since we're playing, I, I'm showing you how I actually use these games as well. Ready? Have any of you been to Paris? that right. We arrived in Paris yesterday. Most of the time when we're talking about countries, titles, and places, we do not use an article. Exceptions would be when you have something that's talking about multiple places that have kind of been turned into one over time. For example, we arrived in America, you could say, but you would have to say we arrived in the United States. We arrived in the UK. Because United Kingdom, United States, it's talking about multiple different provinces, multiple different states combined into one. Um, it's just one of those weird things. Most of the time, though, you do not need to have um, the province there. Okay. Uh, sorry, you don't need to have the article there. Okay, Binata's in the lead now. <clears throat> I was born on 3rd... <laughs> I love that face. Okay. I was born on the third of July. This one because there are only there's only one third of July. You can't say I was born on the second third of July. No, there's only one third of July. And so since it's a very specific date, you would use the because the is something very specific. A and an is when you're talking in general. This is a tricky one. As I said, this one is a tricky one. When we say I go to bed or I went to bed, we're not actually talking about physically going to a bed. What do we actually mean? We actually mean I'm going to sleep. So in this sense, bed is actually treated more like a verb. So you don't need to have the in there. So this one is a little tricky because when we say, oh, I'm gonna go to bed, you don't actually mean you're going to bed. You could be sleeping on the couch. You could uh, you know, be going to a hotel room, who knows? But 
when you say I'm going to bed, you actually mean the verb to sleep. And so this one, you don't actually need it. So this is one of the, tr the, the tricky ones there. Remember what I said about ST? And yes, there are two answers you have to fill out here. Um, so, you don't need one for the first one, Heathrow, it's just the title there, you don't need it. And then for the second one, because it is a superlative, busiest, you do need it. So you need the, the. Um, and uh, somebody just typed a question, I didn't have a chance to read it, please remind me to um, answer that question right after uh, the quiz is over. We only got two more questions. Give you a hint. Think of how many capitals there are in Turkey. Okay, so there's only one capital in Turkey. Now, if you said Ankara is a city in Turkey, because you just say um, there are many cities, but because we have capital city, there's only one capital city, and so it needs to be the in that case. How many towns do you live in? You just live in one, your friend lives in the same one. And so it would have to be the because it's a very specific town that you live in. Okay, who's the winner? Third place, Eddie, you were first for so long. Second place, Margarita. And first place, Inara. And runners up, we had Alima and Saeed. Congratulations. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing this now. Um, and let me turn off that sound real quick. It will keep going forever if I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, let's see, the question that I was asked. Hello, I have such a question. What if during online studies, students will get used to learn the material only in the game format? Ah, okay. And on returning to the university for physical classes, they will have some difficulties in learning material. Okay. So um, this lecture that I originally created, this presentation, this workshop, was originally designed for in-person. I adapted it for online um, because of uh, COVID-19 and the need, and so I switched some things around. But um, no, even when I'm teaching university courses, even I've taught from kindergarten all the way up to 60-year-olds, no matter what age I'm teaching, I do use a lot of these games in the way of teaching um, to help them to learn and to motivate them, even when I'm teaching APA format. And if any of you have done research papers, APA format is not a fun thing. I even use games in that to get students excited about it to practice because I could just sit and lecture the entire time with them, teaching them that. But if we do some type of competition, it makes it so much easier for them to to actually get engaged in the content. Even when I was studying for my own master's degree and I was learning about all the different linguists and when they did what, um, I created matrices um, and created different uh, spreadsheets and made a game for myself. And I started playing with some of my friends um, in Japan and China. Um, this was distance learning back then at the time, uh, just to, to motivate us to learn because I could just study and try to memorize everything. But if I did it in some type of competition format, it, uh, it made it much easier for me to, to remember. Okay. So um, here is, sorry, actually I'm gonna exit out of the full screen here real quick because I want to share that link with you physically and it won't let me do that if I have the share screen on. Not sure why, but it won't. Um, so this is a American English Resources it is a website that you can use. It's completely free, and it has lots of different uh, 
different aspects um, that you can use to, uh, to help yourself learn and to also help, uh, help students that you might have learn as well. So let's go back. And it's not letting me share again, which it should in just a second, hopefully. We will see. Always have technical difficulties. Always have to be prepared for that. <laughs> and here we go. Now it's back. OK, um, so once again, that's a link that I sent you um, to uh, some of the next slides that I'm going to show you. And I know some of you have used it uh, um, have used this before. It's just a quick, um, uh, I'm only going to do a quick review because I, there's one other activity I want to do with you guys before this um, the session is over. But this is AmericanEnglish.com and it's basically just got a lot of different resources. I use it for games, um, for student-made games as well, and for games that are just pre-made you can with your students. So um, one of the things I like is you can choose, you know, what level of school uh, you're going to be teaching at or what level you want for yourself and then I chose games and puzzles and it gives me a lot of different options as to what I can use and you can click on any of these and it gives you instructions for how to play the game and it gives you a PDF of the board game as well here's an example of one of the games that they have um, so what I would do online for this one is I would have uh, the students roll and then they have to um, excuse me they have to roll and land on one of these, and then they have to tell something about themselves using that word. For example, they roll, uh, let's say that, uh, um, that Margarita rolls a, a three, and then she has one, two, three, she rolls on stars. I put it on a screen share where I can actually cross it off and show that that's where she's at. And then she has to create a sentence using that word with stars. And you can even make it more interactive saying, okay, now she has to ask a question about it. And that goes on to actually this next one that I do, where I do have them form questions. Um, so let's say now uh, it's Makalat's turn. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, but let's say it rolls a four. So one, two, three, four, lands on vacation. Like, okay, I'm gonna make a question about vacation. So asks um, Nurlai, uh, what was your favorite vacation spot? And then Nurlai has to answer that question. And it gets them talking, gets them engaged. So there's not as much competition in this type of game, but it's really good for conversing and for getting students um, engaged in that aspect of it as well. Sorry, I'm moving a little bit fast for this part, but I do wanna to get to the next part, the last part really quick. Um, this is a build your own board game. So basically what you're doing here is you are creating a board game that your students are creating it. So you have vocabulary that you've already gone over with your students. Say you're talking about environment, okay? So you would have one of the words be pollution, one of the words be um, clean, uh, smog, whatever you want. Then the students would make rules for how to play a board game. And then you would have a day where you're playing it in class. And you can do this virtually, or you can do it back when, uh, if we uh, ever get on in person again, hopefully we will. But it works for both aspects of it. But students love making their own board games and trying to explain them. It gets them thinking, and it lowers the effective filter, like I was talking about before. OK, um, so let's see. i read those chats real quick. <laughs> Thank you, Zay. Um, so have any of you ever heard of emoji, um, movies told through emojis? Have any of you ever heard of that before? No. No? Okay. I'm going to make sure the sound is on on this one. Yeah, it is. Um, we don't have time to watch the whole thing. It's a short one, but I want you to just watch this. Have, have any of you seen the movie Aladdin, either the live action or the yes. cartoon? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. this is the movie Aladdin as told through emojis.
So you guys get the idea. Um, this was actually made by Disney, but it gave me the idea of something that we can do with, with our students. And uh, it is using the different um, emojis because, well, how do I put this? I was, I was very surprised with how many students, um, how many of the teachers that I worked with actually used um, WhatsApp for their regular instruction. And you know, students they love uh, using emojis. They love um, you know texting and and doing <coughs> excuse me and uh, doing all different aspects like that. And so I'm just going to share this with you. I know I only got one minute left. So I have students do something like this, where they just create their own emojis to tell a story. This one is um, America. Sorry, uh, Iron Man. Okay, so they gave him the serum, they made him strong, he fought the Red Skull, and then he was frozen for 40 years. Just a really quick story, not as long as the Aladdin one, but having the students create, um, having the students create these different ideas using uh, emoticons, emojis, and then they have to tell that story. Or you could have a list of like 10 different stories, and one group chooses one of those stories, and they have to come up with emojis that tell that story. And then they have another group pick which story they think matches their emojis. And it's a way to get the students engaged and talking um, about things instead of the, the traditional um, way. It just gets them a little bit more engaged with it. Do you guys see how you might be able to use something like this for, for your students? Seem like it might be something useful, I hope, in some ways. <laughs> That's a great idea. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> I hope it will be, be useful for you. I wanted to actually have you guys practice doing it, but we're out of time right now. Um, are there any questions for me? Um, I know that there are other uh, Go Viral workshops and such too, but any uh, questions Steph, for me? Steph, actually, um, there is, uh, like the, the next session is supposed to start at 4.30. So we can just, I think, a little bit go over uh, in this particular session. So that's why, uh, yeah, like, I don't know, five minutes more. So if you guys yeah, have questions, please. And you don't have to rush. Okay, we'll do it. Okay, we'll do a question and answer sec segment if anyone has any uh, questions, thoughts or ideas or anything that you have done that you have found very useful. We had Arjan um, who wanted to ask question in person with her voice, if she's still with us. Okay, she's not with us. 
Okay. <laughs> Someone was starting to talk just before that. <laughs> yeah, I started. So um, I use uh, quizzes. Do you know that? Quizzes. Quizlet or quizzes? Uh, no, quizzes. Quizzes. Um, I've read ah, it before. One of my old teachers told me about it, but I haven't used it. Um, okay. So uh, there are lots of uh, quiz that you can do it that uh, you can do this with the children, then um, you want to revise grammar or something like that. And uh, it's more, I think, interesting than the quiz because they've got some, um, uh, uh, how to say, memo? No, not memo. Like Notes? Notes? Uh, just uh, uh, slides, they uh, appear, then oh, okay. um, the students are um, answering something and uh, after their answers, uh, some pictures appear with their um, kidding, something like that, so with funny pictures, so uh, you, you are doing great or something like that, or... <laughs> More interactive. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I never started, I was gonna use it last year with Spanish, uh, two years ago with Spanish students because that's where my uh, teacher was using it. And she said it was very engaging for them, but I never got a chance to use it. Uh, to answer somebody's question, it's, it's an application similar to Kahoot and uh, Quizlet, um, but it's called Quizzes, correct, Agarim, Quizzes? Yeah, right, um, Q, U, Y, uh, sorry, I, double Z, I, Z, Quizzes. Yeah. Quizzes. Any other ideas, thoughts, or questions? Thank you for sharing that, Agarim. My pleasure. Have you ever heard of a game, uh, Hangman? Yes. It is, it is great to check the vocabulary, and my students just enjoy playing it. They enjoy uh, guessing the word, and also they enjoy choosing the word. And when I, as a teacher, cannot like guess the word they are just like yeah i won yes. so it's great so for those of you who haven't seen hangman is something similar to this and so you have a word that you want them to guess and for every letter they get wrong you add a part of the person so if they get one wrong then i put the head they get one oh, no. like they guessed k <laughs> And some people don't like it because, you know, it's literally about somebody hanging. <laughs> There's another version to play that's not called Hangman. I don't remember what it is, but I grew up playing this all the time. And it's, it is a good way to get them practicing. And uh, they always choose the vowels first because um, vowels, there's always a vowel in English. Uh, in Russian, you guys don't use nearly as many vowels as we do in English. <laughs> um, you use a lot more consonants. Strasvitsya. There's so many consonants in that word. <laughs> um, but we use vowels all the time, so they choose the vowels first, and uh, it, it's a it's a fun game, fun activity for uh, for some of the students. Any other uh, thoughts or suggestions you guys have to share with anyone else, or questions? Well, this is something. Um, if anyone has, feel free to interrupt me. But this is something that I think is the most important, and especially in this time of uh, you know some people doing. Uh, blended learning, like partly online, partly in class, or just completely online. Use each other as resources, whether you're a student, whether you're a teacher, uh, whether you're whatever you are, use each other as resources because it's so easy to feel isolated. And I think it's so important to, uh, to talk to each other, to share. Um, I tell this to all of the teachers I've worked with. I even encourage them to have their own WhatsApp app groups. In fact, I still have a Google Classroom, even though I'm not their, uh, uh, their instructor anymore, that I still share ideas with them and they still share with me. Um, and it's, it's just a great, great idea to share with each other and don't be afraid to ask other people for ideas and don't be afraid to give your own um, opinion um, as well and give your own ideas and feedback. Anyhow, thank you guys so much. You have been an excellent uh, uh, group. This has been a fun session. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with Go Viral. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody.
It was a really interactive, so much fun. I think we've never had any uh, so <laughs> such a fun workshop before <laughs> with the games <laughs> and everything. <laughs> yeah. It's fun to do. I enjoy it. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, I think uh, we can just um, wrap it up, I guess. Um, so thank you, everybody, and stay in touch with Go Viral. Uh, follow us on social media, because in the future, even though we're going to finish the festival, Go Viral will still continue, So, which means that we're going to still have more sessions, and perhaps we're going to invite Seth again, who knows. Um, so yes, follow, follow us on social media. And thank you again for being such a great uh, participants in this workshop. Thank you, Seth, for your time. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Das Sabol. Bye. Thank you.